I am Jenny Spencer. I am the Ward 15 representative on Cleveland City Council. And I would like to call Democracy Day 2021 to order. The public can view this hearing on Cleveland City Council's YouTube channel. For those who are participating on Zoom this evening, I would like to remind everybody to please mute yourselves until it is your time to speak. And uh, I may remind us all of this later. However, each person will have five minutes to speak or less and time will be kept. I would truly like to thank everyone who is participating this evening, particularly those representing Move to Amend. Thank you for your leadership. I will be introducing our speakers shortly, but I'd now like to read chapter 106 of amended ordinance 1015-16. Chapter 106, Democracy Day. 106.01, .01, Democracy Day, public hearing. Beginning in the year 2017, the mayor and city council shall designate one day in the second week of May following the November federal elections as Democracy Day, a call for a US constitutional amendment. On this day, the mayor and city council shall sponsor a public hearing in a public space within the city. The city shall publicize the public hearing on its website and through area media at least one month in advance of the hearing. The public hearing will examine the impact on the city of political contributions of corporations, unions, political action committees, and super PACs. The mayor and at least one city council person shall submit testimony at the public hearing. In addition, all citizens of Cleveland will be permitted to submit oral testimony for a period of five minutes per citizen. The public hearing shall be held during an evening or weekend time. The city shall record the minutes of the hearing and make them available to the public no later than three months after the hearing by posting them on council's or the city's website. Section 106.02, letter. Within one week following the public hearing, the clerk shall send a letter to the leaders of the Ohio House and Senate and Cleveland's US congressional representatives and both Ohio US senators stating that a public hearing was held to support an amendment to the US constitution declaring a, only human beings, not corporations, are legal persons with constitutional rights, and B, money is not equivalent to speech, and therefore regulating political contributions and spending is not equivalent to limiting political speech. Section 106.03, further hearings. The biennial public hearings will continue for a period of 10 years through May, 2027, or until a constitutional amendment reflecting the principles set forth in section 106.02 is ratified by three quarters of state legislators, legislatures. I would now also like to read a statement from Cleveland Mayor Frank G. Jackson. The purpose of the Democracy Day hearing as required by the ordinance is to examine the impact on our city, our state and our nation of political influence by corporate entities and big money. Members of the public are invited and will be given the opportunity to speak on these matters. The influence of political contributions in the civic sphere is a worthy discussion, not only by government officials, but with the valuable, valuable input of citizens, said Mayor Frank G. Jackson. Democracy Day is an important opportunity for residents to voice their opinions and concerns on this issue to further the goal of preserving and protecting our democracy. I am truly delighted to play a part this evening in our virtual 2021 Democracy Day for the city of Cleveland. And again, would like to thank those assembled for your leadership in making this evening possible. I, uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our, our speakers for this evening. I have a list of speakers before me. I would first like to invite Steve Norris, co-chair of Move to Amend Cleveland, who will provide a little more background and context for us prior to moving into our roster of speakers. Steve. 
Uh, thanks. Um, uh, my, hello, my name is Steve Norris. I, I as you said, am co-chair of uh, Move to Amend Cleveland, along with Lois Romanoff. And we'd like to welcome everyone to uh, Cleveland's Democracy Day public hearing. Uh, thanks to uh, City Council for uh, for organizing this, uh, for hosting. Thanks to the speakers for preparing testimony. Uh, thanks to, to everyone who's watching for your time and energy supporting democracy. Move to Amend is a grassroots organization wor working to end corporate dominance and building uh, build a vibrant democracy. Many people are familiar with the infamous Citizens United ruling, which struck down campaign finance laws and flooded the airwaves with attack ads. But the Supreme Court has been building corporate power for over a century. The first, fourth, fifth, and 14th amendments have expanded from their original intent as human rights to become a potent check on local home rule. Across the United States, 705 communities in seven states have called to end money as speech and corporate constitutional rights. 26 of Ohio's cities and towns have passed ballot initiatives or city council resolutions, including recently Talmadge and Painesville. Federally, uh, Congressional Representatives Marcy Kaptur and Tim Ryan are co-sponsors. And in the Ohio legislatures, we'd like to thank uh, sponsors Mike Skindell and Nick Antonio, uh, along with eight House and two Senate co-sponsors. And if anyone hasn't yet become a citizen co-sponsor to the We the People Amendment, please join um, over 478,000 others and sign at movetoamend.org slash motion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Steve. I would now like to invite individuals to offer their testimony. The first individual listed is Lois Romanoff, co-chair of Move to Amend Cleveland. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Um, thank you all for coming and especially thank you, Congresswoman, um, Councilwoman Spencer for leading us today uh, and so many of the staff people who have helped do really appreciate all of your help. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about charter schools. Charter schools are corporations. They often make, they often make a handsome profit for their owners. President Biden said he is against all for-profit charter schools. However, charter schools often present a nonprofit facade when a for-profit school appears to be a not-for-profit school. For example, on the state, in the state of Arizona, which allows for-profit organizations to hold a school charter, charters are run for profit nearly always, but they incorporate as nonprofits. This relationship in, enables charter schools to be eligible for federal funds that include IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and the federal program called Charter Schools Program. The charter industry is making a fortune, not just in Arizona, but everywhere, mainly through the money that comes from the government. A recent change in Ohio's law is that the state now pays for the tuition of every child who goes to a charter school rather than the public school uh, district paying for the tuition as it has been in the past. However, this is still government money paying for charter students. When most of us first learned about charters, we were told that the families um, and teachers that initiated charter schools for children who, who because they learn differently, um, they were not considered handicapped. But in fact, when the first charter schools were open in Minnesota in 1992, within five years, that school, the schools that opened, four of the now dominant brick and mortar for profit charter schools began building their operations. And at the same time, the three largest online for profit charters also began building their operations. Charter schools were designed as a business model. They pay their teachers 50 to 40% less of, well, 50 to 
40% less than a public school teachers are make. The teachers often do not uh, have advanced degrees or the same educational experience at pub as public school teachers have. Extracurricular activities such as music, drama, sports, and much stronger um, traditional schools are also available. Public schools have unions that also protect the rights and finances of their teachers. The initiators of charter schools were rich entrepreneurs like Bill Gates, the Walton Foundation, the Walton um, people of Walmart, Reed Hastings of Net Netflix, and many others whose goal is to end public schools entirely. We know this because of the lobbyists who work for them. And they do this because they hate public things that are public. They think it is inefficient and they hate unions. That's the initiators of the schools. Public schools are a democracy model, also paid for by taxpayers, but not where a profit is the goal and where every child is welcomed, where a school board is elected from the people who live in that community and know what the school needs. Let's continue the democracy model and end education for profit. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lois, for that infor those informative comments and that testimony. Next, I'd like to welcome John Howell to provide testimony. Thank you, and will, will my slides be shown or is that not possible? Yes, uh, they're being shared now. Great. Well, I'd like to thank you all and congratulate you for this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, procedure you have for honoring democracy and, and, and pursuing it in, in this way. Uh, um, my name is John Howell, I'm from Athens, and, but I represent uh, uh, two organizations, Democracy Over Corporations and uh, the Alliance for Just Money. Uh, the United States is, of course, a republic, and in a republic, the demo a democracy depends upon the integrity of elections. The elections have become heavily influenced by money. Fortunately, elections are not totally under the control of money, and I congratulate those public servants, many of you who do represent the will of the people. We must protect the electoral process against attack by those who prefer minority rule over majority rule. Could my slides be put on? Uh... One second, I'm getting... We're almost there. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And you can go on to the next slide, if you will, please. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Good. So wealth and power, as you all know, form a self-reinforcing cycle. And the power part of that cycle must be attacked through such measures as the We the People constitutional amendment as promoted by Move to Amend. And that, of course, as you all know, is the amendment to end corporate personhood and money as speech. But the concentration of wealth itself must also be addressed. Go on to the next slide, please. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis once said, we can have democracy in this country, or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of a few but we cannot have both. Next slide, please. What is responsible for the extreme concentration of wealth we see today? Several things in our economic system share the blame, including corporate monopolies. 
But the central mechanism of wealth concentration is the monetary system itself. The monetary system is a system by which money is created and destroyed, by which money is issued and then withdrawn. It is the system that controls the money supply. Next slide, please. There are two kinds of money, currency, which is bills and coins, and account money. Account money exists only as numbers in accounts. In computers today, about 95% of our money is account money. It is what you get paid with and what you pay your bills with. All account money is created, not by government, but by private banks as they make loans. Loans are not transfers from savers to borrowers. Loans represent the creation of new money. With every loan extended, the money supply rises. As loans are repaid, the money supply falls. Banks collect interest on all the money in circulation and wealth concentrates into the financial sector. Next slide, please. For every dollar in circulation, there's a dollar of debt. Without debt, we have no money. But who gets the money and who gets the debt? And as you know, here, as represented here, 35%, the top 1% of the population holds 35% of the net worth. And you can see then people down here who are, are in the bottom, 60%, um, hold only 3% of the net worth, but they hold most of the debt. New money created by bank loans goes to those with good credit ratings, to those who already have money, not to public services. Next slide, please. It doesn't have to be this way. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution authorizes Congress to create money. Government creation of money got us through the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Civil War. It was money spent by government into circulation rather than being lent into circulation. Government spending of money into circulation creates no debt. We need government creation of money now to face the challenges of our time. The legislation to do that was introduced in Congress in 2011 by Dennis Kucinich representing the Cleveland area, but the bill was not acted upon. It needs reintroduction. Next slide, please. The seconds. current monetary system concentrates wealth. It fails to address the needs of people. It causes economic instability in the forms of booms and busts, recessions like we're all familiar with, which are bad for business and for people. And finally, it sustains poverty and financial insecurity. Creation of money by the federal government can change this. It can provide funds for states, municipalities like Cleveland and townships to meet community needs in education, housing, and healthcare. And it can do these things without additional debt. What we can do as a country should be constrained only by the real limits of raw materials and labor, not by money. Money is limiting for you and me because we don't create money. The government can create money and it should. The final slide, please. So bank creation of money concentrates wealth and undermines democracy. Government creation of money distributes wealth and makes democracy possible. I urge you to advocate not only for the, the uh, constitutional amendment that you've already spoken of, but also for monetary reform. Thank you for the opportunity of being with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Howell. The next individual to provide testimony will be Greg Coleridge. Greg might, Greg is gonna be late. Oh, he's the one who will be late, apologies. Yes, yes. Okay, then the next, the next individual I'll invite forward is Randy Cunningham. If Brandy is not available, the next individual on my list to provide testimony is Dave Lima. Thank you, uh, Council uh, Members Spencer, Valencic, and Griffin. I'm uh, glad to have you 
uh, on our call today. There has, uh, and I am uh, Dave Lima. I'm the coordinator of Mentor Move to Amend. I also serve on the coordinating committee for Ohio Move to Amend. Uh, there has been uh, ongoing tension in the history of the United States between legislative efforts to limit the influence of money and political power and judicial warnings and rulings curbing Congress's power to do so. Particularly in the last 50 years, legislative efforts and Supreme Court rulings have made pivotal changes to the role that money plays in our democracy. Efforts to restrict the influence of money have been rolled back largely based on the misguided narrative that artificial entities are people and money is equivalent to speech protected by the First Amendment. In addition to previous court rulings, the Citizens United ruling effectively freed labor unions, corporations, and nonprofit uh, associations from restrictions on electioneering and allowed advocacy for the election or defeat of candidates. The court ruled that political action groups, super PACs, can receive unlimited donations and make unlimited election expenditures so long as they do not directly coordinate with candidates' campaigns. The Citizens United ruling rests on two assumptions that have since proven false. The majority reason that independent spending cannot be corrupted and that such spending would be transparent. The court's narrow interpretation of corruption was limited to quid pro quo, which assumes a direct connection between donations and political favors. But the corruption influence of money on policy decisions and political priorities is much more nuanced. Over the past decade, these special interests have spent unlimited and often undisclosed amounts of money to advance their agendas. Impacts could be seen just five years after the ruling. In 2015, analysts found clear evidence that a very small group of Americans, an elite club of wealthy, largely white mega donors were wielding increasing influence in politics. By 2018, a Pew poll found that 75% of Americans believe government was run by a few big interests looking out for themselves. The Supreme Court also reasoned that unlimited spending would not be, uh, would not distort the political process because the public would be informed about funding for political activity. The reality is that voters often cannot know who is actually behind campaign spending. So while super PACs are required to disclose their donors, those donors can include dark money groups that obscure the original source of their contributions. Since dark money, nonprofits do not need to disclose their donors, they provide a back channel to inundate our, our politics with money from secret sources. Now armed with 10 years of data, we have compel a compelling picture of this disturbing trend, a massive influx of big money in politics. Just 25 ultra rich individuals account for close to half of the total individual donations to super PACs from 2010 to 2020. The top five largest individual super PAC contributors of the decade accounted for 28% of all donations. The issue of money in, poli in politics is also a bipartisan problem. In the 2017-2018 cycles of contributions, 45% of donations went to outside spending groups aligned with the Republican Party and 52% went to 
went to spending groups benefiting Democrats. Various legislative efforts have been derailed by the courts claiming that artificial entities are people with First Amendment speech rights, and since money has been declared speech, curbing such speech is a violation of the Constitution. This leaves us with no other alternative but to have a 28th constitutional amendment declaring that artificial entities are not people and money is not speech. Such an amendment would provide the opportunity for legislative efforts to correct this distortion of reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lima. The next individual I'd like to call forward to provide testimony is Steve Haleko. Thank you. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the Cuyahoga County Progressive Caucus. The week before last, we had a wonderful event in our city, the NFL draft. And before the NFL draft, you had all kinds of scouting reports on the players who might be drafted, their statistics, how fast they are, how tall they are, how strong they are, who they played for. And the analyzers are trying to figure out who's the best one to get picked. And we, of course, are interested in who the Browns are going to pick. We have a very important event coming up in our city. And that is the Cleveland mayor's election. Right now, we're in the campaign announcement season. And after a candidate announces, the media does an article which is kind of like a scouting report. It indicates what public office the candidate has held, what their position on the issues might be. But the most important aspect of that scouting report is how much money they have. Let me just read you a few headlines and experts and excerpts from the announcement articles. Now, I'm not gonna read the candidate's name. And if you're paying attention, maybe you can guess who it's referring to. Candidate A has more than $116,000 in his or her campaign account. Candidate B, early campaign contributions make him or her instant contender in 2021 mayoral race, has been raising money for months and has reported nearly $160,000 on hand. Candidate C, leads pack of potential mayor candidates in money race, has more than $500,000 on hand, according to most recent campaign finance report. Candidate D hasn't raised much money because of the job he or her has been working on. And candidate E has raised more than $80,000 from June 29th to December 31st. Now, let me read you some other headlines that occurred over the last year from the start of the pandemic. Last March, Sherwin-Williams to begin headquarter construction, but details predictably scant about $100 million public subsidized project. Last December, Cleveland OK's unprecedented subsidy for Rich Flats East Bank developer who can forego property tax payment until 2071. Quick note, thank you very much, Councilwoman Spencer, for voting against that. And in February, Cleveland to give Rocket Mortgage another handout. By the way, four years ago, a major issue in the mayor's race was, of course, the then Quicken Loans Arena renovations and then the referendum. The referendum failed. The beautiful glass atrium and all of the renovations inside are, are now in place. It's still being paid for. It's still being paid for by portions of each ticket sold that would go to Cleveland's general revenue fund. Tickets being sold 
Want to guess how far behind we are now? How many tickets have been sold in the last year to events at the arena? Now, those of us in the activist community call this the corporate welfare system. But the gig is up even if you're not a member of the activist community. Candidates sometimes get caught. And, and we saw this most recently with the HB6 scandal. And, and by getting caught, I mean a vote so horrendous and a campaign contribution so horrendous that, that it can't be overlooked. And the, the standard answer is, oh, well, yeah, yeah. They, they gave me lots of money, but that in no way influenced my vote. That's laughable. And everybody knows it. That's why we have very low voter turnout in the city of Cleveland. That's why last week, there were a couple of articles on the mayoral race, which said candidates are plagued by low name recognition. And these are the top candidates, elected officials, big names that we who are here tonight know, but nobody else knows. Because the feeling is, it's the same old, same old. Now maybe, just maybe, if we had publicly financed campaigns and the scouting report only issued positions on the issues, previously held elected positions, and the public got wind that we were having an election about ideas and not money. We would have higher voter turnout and we would have a government truly of the people, by the people, and for the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Haleko. I would now like to invite Terry Ross forward to provide testimony. If Terry Ross is not available, I would like to invite Daryl Davis to provide testimony. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I have been looking forward to it. I live in the city of Cleveland. I have been active in community uh, events and community issues for the last 20 years. We have a set crisis in our country. It's destroying our quality of life and the planet. We've lost control of our government to corporations and the false ideology that favors an interpretation of economic policy referred to as conservatism, but is best defined as lawlessness. Here are two examples of corporate control over the issues I'm working on. First of all is the inappropriate development in the city of Cleveland. The uh, City Planning Commission, with the complicity of the mayor and some, not all, of the city council members, has moved to subvert responsible zoning and citizens' right to exercise control of their neighborhoods and traditional and landmark districts Instead, we have form-based zoning that will eliminate uh, Board of Zoning Appeals hearings for variances. Every decision in favor of developments is fortified with the opinion that developers face too much uncertainty in getting approval for projects that require as many as 12 variances. I have actually seen that. And the cost destroys their profitability. These people have already have 15-year tax abatements tax incentives and financing arrangements that involve HUD money intended for affordable housing. Developers look upon successful neighborhoods as their God-given opportunity with funding intended to restore struggling neighborhoods. If you wonder how this can happen, I suggest you review the campaign finance reports of the Council Leadership Fund. My second issue is noise in the city. It has become intolerable. Constant din of trucks, construction equipment, emergency vehicles, sirens, amplified horns. That's one thing. We know that'll happen. Cleveland has ordinances against modified mufflers, boom speakers on cars, backyard fireworks, speeding in unlicensed dirt bikes and ATVs, popping wheelies, 
zigzagging through traffic, but these laws are not being enforced. In an article describing the effects of ex excessive noise, Noise Free America states, excessive noise has been linked to hearing loss, tinnitus, sleep deprivation, cardiovascular disturbances, mental health impairment, impaired task performance, aggressive behavior and chronic fatigue. Manufacturers of this noise making equipment feel free to market their products with slogans described by Noise Free America as vicious antisocial advertisements. Sony's slogan for its exploded speakers is disturb the peace. Does anyone in the city's government relish going up against Sony's civil rights granted by its personhood? How about BP at the corner of Fulton and Denison where loud cars park at all hours of the night, sometimes 4.30 in the morning with their stereos blasting? We can't get BP to get rid of them. Corporate oligarchs not satisfied with winning every court case formed the American Legislative Exchange Council. ALEC is a membership organization of corporations, trade organizations, and politicians. Sony is a member. The corporations write model bills that the politician members are required to introduce into their legislatures. Ohio's ALEC state chairs are Representative Scott Wiggum, a member of the House Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and Senator Rob McCauley, member of the Senate Energy and Public Utilities Committee. Com Committee. McCauley introduced Senate Bill 52, which gives local governments the right to hold referendums on siting of utility scale wind and solar installations. A list of all the state chairs is readily available to uh, legislators. Corporate chairs are no longer listed. That should tell any savvy legislator where they rank in the ALEC hierarchy. First energy, <clears throat> I've been working on repeal of HB6. They have announced that they will cooperate with the Department of Justice in seeking and securing convictions of the indicted legislators in exchange for the deferred prosecution agreement, which can allow it to avoid criminal charges. That is probably another indicator of which class of operators is more important in this scheme. Elliot Ness is spinning in his grave. This is racketeering and we shouldn't have to deal with it at this time, but because corporations have persons, we're stuck. We must get moved to amend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis. I would now like to invite Larry Bressler forward to provide testimony. Hi, um, yeah, I'm Larry Bressler. I'm speaking on behalf of Organize Ohio and the End Poverty Now Coalition. Um, as we're meeting here in terms of Democracy Day, we're not here just to promote the democratic process, but to kind of stop the anti-democratic process that's happening in Ohio and across the country. Um, what first thing I just want to talk about briefly is I've been um, is out of the our end poverty now coalition. We started something called Utilities for All, which is an organization that works for um, to stop utility shutoffs um, and to and, and, and in terms of terms of terms of fair rates. And when we started, we, there was somewhat of a focus with us in terms of the shutoffs that had been happening with uh, Cleveland Public Power and, uh, and in terms of them not follow, following some of the statutes and the ordinances in the city of Cleveland. During that time, um, all of a sudden, there was, there was this uh, widespread um, leaflet pamphlet that went out to every, I think every single resident of the city of Cleveland certainly came to me, um, that was publicly critical of CPP and it's despair, despair, saying that the rates were bad and the service was bad and nobody knew where this came from. Like many people thought it came from our little group, which of course it did not. Of course, what it turned out to happen was that this came um, from First Energy. It was part of their dark money efforts um, 
to, uh, to, to hurt CPP, hopefully to destroy it. Um, and probably, pr probably with the idea that First Energy would then take over, take, take over Cleveland Public Power and that we would not have a choice anymore. I was an individual back in the 1970s that worked hard, went door to door, trying to fight to, to save at that time Cleveland Uni, the municipal light system, which we did. And whatever the problems that we have with CPP today, it's, it still gives us a choice and gives it's a city owned system that we want to support. And the idea of this dark money coming forward, it just kind of amplifies why we're here today in terms of uh, we, we, it took a long time for us to realize where that came from at the time, although I think we all kind of assumed. So I hope hopefully that serves and is, um, shows why we need the kind of thing that why we need um, to stop the dark money, why we need uh, um, the, the kind of efforts that are being done in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, of changing the laws that 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 allow this to happen. The other thing I want to talk about very briefly, um, which I think kind of goes a little bit is part of this, but I think we need to rec remember it is the is the wave of voter suppression laws that, that are coming across the country, and uh, here in uh, in Ohio. I really thought that we were going to buck them. We were like one of the two, only like three states in the country where nothing had been introduced. And my assumption was that because everything went so smoothly in the last election, not to say that there weren't problems in terms of st still some voter suppression, but the fact that the election went so smoothly that we weren't going to have a problem in and, 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 and that we weren't going to have the kind of voter suppression laws that happened. But of course, that could never happen in Ohio. Um, and and of course we've have we now have the first of those that just been introduced in the last week. It would limit drop boxes to, to one per county by the board of elections. So you you only have one you, you may only have one in Augalize County, which is very sparsely populated, and you have one in Cleveland, one in one in Cuyahoga County, and that one has to be at the board of elections. So as as many of us remember, the last one when they had when they had those. Uh, those boxes there, people were lined up, not in cars, in persons, going all the way down to um, to the inner belt. Clearly not a safe thing, but that's what, but that's what happened in this. Um, it would also um, no, uh, limit to a substantial degree the curing of small mistakes on absentee ballots. We all make those kind of mistakes, but now our votes are much more likely to be invalidated based on this legislation has been introduced. It would now require two forms of identification rather than one to, uh, to apply for absentee ballots under this. It would also limit early voting. Clearly this is an intent. The intent of this legislation is to hurt places like Cuyahoga County, particularly the city of Cleveland. We need to remember in the last election that this voter suppression that already happened um, resulted in only 53% of eligible Cleveland Clevelanders voting compared to 68% of the countywide. And in some of the Southern and Western suburbs, it was as high as 84%. So I would ask, I would ask our city council, I would ask our city council members, our mayor, for us to join together to, to fight this voter suppression legislation that's currently in the house. And we don't know what's gonna be introduced in the Senate. And we wanna be, be able to promote democracy in a way that helps all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bressler. I would now like to invite Yavanka Hall to come forward to provide testimony if Yavanka is available. If not, I would like to invite Ryan Houlihan to come forward to provide testimony. Ryan, are you available? Hello? Yes, you're unmuted. Oh, great, great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman, and uh, thank you, Council members, for your presence here today. And I'm just uh, appearing on behalf of uh, the Single Pair Action Network uh, that's uh, SPAN, Ohio. And uh, what I'm here to talk about is uh, a single pair healthcare system. And basically, there are four components of a single pair healthcare system. One is that there can only be one source of money paying for all medically prescribed or emergency services. It can be a
private or public en entity with obvious oversight. Either way, it derives its power and thus authority from the fact that it's the only source of money paying for health care claims. Number two, this one payer has the authority to negotiate prices for all drugs and medical equipment. Number three, this one payer has the authority to negotiate all costs for services provided by doctors. And number four, this one payer has the authority to negotiate all costs for services provided by hospitals. So this in general, uh, with variations, is the way it's done in every other industrialized nation in the world. And an overwhelming majority of physicians in the US support single payer, including uh, Dr. Jonathan Ross, who wrote a letter to the Toledo Blade. He's the past president of the Physicians for a National Healthcare Book Program. And he wrote that physicians sh share your concern about the scourge of surprise billing. That's another thing that we wanna cure. It's but one symptom of a broken healthcare system built on administrative complexity and profiteering. Seeking the care they need, patients must contend with limited provider networks, co-payments and deductibles. To provide care, caregivers must deal with hundreds of insurers, each with variable payment rules and requirements. Some hospitals now employ more billing courts than nurses. Uh, to end this madness, we need an improve Medicare for all. This single payer approach would reduce Healthcare administrative waste by 600 billion yearly by some estimates. These savings can be applied to universal coverage of all medically necessary care, including dental, vision, and long-term care without increasing total U.S. healthcare costs. It would streamline billing through one payer, freeing up hospitals and doctors to focus on patient care. Medicare for all would fund hospitals through publicly approved global operating budgets, providing a lifeline to struggling rural and urban hospitals. For patients, Medicare for All would provide free choice of doctors and hospitals. It would narrow networks, co-pays, deductibles, and surprise bills would be a thing of the past. So that's from uh, Dr. Jonathan Ross. So also what it would cure is medical bankruptcies. Uh, we find that every year in America, they estimate there are 500,000 medical bankruptcies a year because of the current healthcare system. Uh, doctor, I mean, hospitals, would save $35 billion a year by avoiding uh, pursuing patients with unpaid bills. Uh, it would cost the current healthcare system, public and privately financed, now costs America $3.5 trillion a year. Uh, Medicare for all, by most estimates, would cost $3 trillion a year. So it's a $500 billion savings per year. Uh, there are various studies. By the, uh, including one by the uh, Yale uh, Medical Journal, The Lancet, that state Medicare for all would save $450 billion a year in savings. It would save 68,000 lives that are now being lost because people are uninsured or underinsured, can't afford, to, uh, uh, can't afford care in time to prevent uh, fatal diseases. Uh, and right now, 8 million Americans crowdfund for their medical care, which is atrocious and it's a, abominable. There's a public citizen study that came out a couple months ago that said that hundreds of thousands of deaths and millions of infections from COVID would have been prevented under a Medicare for All system. A Congressional bu Budget Office study, which most people think is authoritative, says we could save everyone $650 billion a year if we went to a Medicare for all system. So, you know, why don't we have it in America? Well, it comes down to money, obviously, and who's benefiting. So what we have is networks like, uh, organizations like Americans for Prosperity, which is part of the Coke network. And they finance what they call the Partnership for America's Healthcare Future. They're basically a lobby representing hospitals, pharma, insurers, medical device makers, or what I call a medical industrial complex. And they spend 10 million, tens of millions of dollars in ads that they really work to dampen public support for Medicare for all. So I, I just want to quote from a study by a couple of professors, Martin Gillens of Princeton and Benjamin Page of Northwest. And they did a study, and what they found was that the central point of their study that emerges from their studies, from their research, is that economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on U.S. government policy, while mass-based interest groups and average citizens have little or no independent influence. 
Uh, the results they found provide substantial support for theories of an economic elite domination and for theories of biased pluralism, but not for theories of majoritarian electoral democracy or majoritarian pluralism. So effectively, you know, we're being outspent by this medical industrial complex and it's supported by their study. So, you know, until we get, until we get a 28th amendment, it's gonna be an uphill battle to achieve something like Medicare for all. Because uh, you know, corporations are considered people and money is considered speech. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Houlihan. I would like to invite Steve Norris to come forward to provide your testimony. All right, thank you. Uh, my testimony today is about police brutality bonds. Um, Acre or the Action Center on Race and the Economy says police brutality bonds quite literally allow banks and wealthy investors to profit from police violence. This is a transfer of wealth from communities, especially over-policed communities of color, to Wall Street and wealthy um, investors. In their report on police brutality bonds, Acre uh, selected Cleveland as a case study. Cleveland issued over $12 million in judgment obligation bonds, which Clevelanders will be paying until 2033 with an additional $7 million plus for investors. How did the Cleveland Police Department owe millions for, of dollars for excessive force? High profile cases include the killing of Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams with 137 bullets fired into a car after a high speed car chase. 12-year-old Tamar Rice held a toy gun and was fatally shot within seconds. Further, the consent decree showed a pattern of shootings and head strikes with impact weapons. The unnecessary, excessive, or retaliatory use of less lethal force, including tasers, chemical spray, and fists. Excessive force against persons who are mentally ill or in crisis, including cases where the officers were called exclusively for a welfare check. The employment of poor and dangerous tactics that place uh, officers in situations where avoidable force uh, becomes inevitable and places officers and civilians at unnecessary risk. Individual police officers are virtually always shielded from court costs by departments. Further, most police departments are insulated from budget cuts as settlements co settlement costs rise. Settlements may contain non-disparagement clauses or predatory silencing that give some restitution to victims, but prevent them from talking about their cases or uh, the officers involved. Most cities are unable or unwilling to account for borrowing costs for settlements. Um, Cleveland raised taxes to co uh, cover the, the costs of consent decree compliance and borrowed to finance settlements. Uh, as the consent decree winds down, uh, Cleveland faces the prospect of losing the community police commission unless action is taken. In addition to reducing police misconduct, over-policing must be reduced. Funding should instead be invested in community support and safety. Let's see. Uh, requiring officers to have liability insurance would support victims of uh, police violence without adding to city budgets. If cities do wind up borrowing, investors should not continue to profit off police brutality. The Federal Reserve makes cheap loans to corporations and it could loan to cities without interest. This would remove profit from the repair of police violence harm. While police departments are a large portion of public budgets, there are additional costs hidden elsewhere, such as school police, transit police, and federal programs like Operation Relentless Pursuit that need, uh, uh, that need transparency and a full accounting. Ending police brutality bonds is an important step toward furthering racial justice and ending corporate rule. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Norris. I'd now like to invite Diane Morgan to come forward and provide testimony. Thank you very much. I appreciate this and, um, and everybody who's contributed tonight. Um, I wanted to say that um, we're at a crossroads in our country and we've stared down the potential for fascism um, in this last election. And the fight is, is far from over. Um, every day, uh, as you've heard, we're facing unprecedented attacks 
impacts on voting rights in states across the country, including um, even Ohio. But um, as important as that is, we need to have a more representative government. We need campaign finance reform at all levels of government. And uh, this, this has to start here in Cleveland. Um, the allowable donation amounts increased recently um, in Cleveland so that a donor can actually donate more to a candidate for mayor in Cleveland than to a presidential candidate. Um, so rather than decreasing the amount that could be donated, it, it has increased. And um, it's been found that in Cincinnati, the, the donation level is now $1,100 per individual. Um, this has helped to limit special interest investing in elections, and it's also increased grassroots funding of campaigns. Um, in addition, we need to eliminate dark money, as has been said earlier, um, nonprofits, and have transparency with PACs and super PACs. The public needs to know who is financing campaigns, whether they are political campaigns, issue-driven, or ballot initiatives like HB6. Um, and this can, we can do all of this here by, um, you know, campaign finance reform in Cleveland. We just need to have the leadership with the vision to do this, including elected officials. And uh, this, these are just one of the many reasons that um, we support Move to Amend. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, which was touched on briefly by someone else, is um, the aspect of more representative government. and. Uh, and having citizen input in our government. And large cities, large and small cities across the uh, America have public comment. And uh, there's been an effort that has been made now that's grassroots driven to provide public support, um, public comment space at Cleveland City Council meetings. And today it was the subject of uh, public comment and was taken up at committee. And it's, it's a start, um, but our government should not be authoritarian, where the only ones whose voices are heard are the special interests, special influencers, or corporations. Uh, decisions should not just be made um, and cutting citizens out of the decision-making process. And it, one of the things I often think about is it any wonder that um, City Hall is mostly reviled. Um, you know, you mentioned to someone the city, and a lot of people, you know, look at the city as like the enemy, um, or the city this, the city that, um, and they mostly feel disenfranchised and disengaged. So we need to begin to build trust. Um, citizens need to feel that they are a welcome part um, of planning for the future of the city, and that there is transparency in decision making, including the budget process. And we need to take a step in the right direction to build a more govern a democratic government by allowing public comment. And that should be solidified by legislation, not by rules change. Um, and I do wanna just add one more comment. Um, we at Our Revolution Ohio believe strongly in move to amend. And uh, when a candidate applies for our endorsement, they are required to take the move to amend pledge. And I would encourage everybody to check that out. Um, you can do it as an individual or as a, um, a uh, public servant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Morgan. I would now like to invite, if they are available, Angela Simone or Simone to come forward and provide testimony. Apologies if I've not pronounced your name correctly. No problem. Thank you for having me speak tonight. My name is Angie Simone. Um, okay, the Supreme Court said this wouldn't happen, corruption that is, in their Citizens United ruling. That's because the majority of the court said corruption could only occur if there was a quid pro quo. Coupled with that, they are argued that transparency would shine a light on transactions keeping the public informed who was supporting various candidates and issues. They must not have heard of 501c4 organizations, social welfare organizations, organizations that don't have to report their donors and amounts contributed. Dark money from these organizations are used to fund the coffers of candidates and various issues up for a vote by the people or by the legislator, like House Bill 6. These dark money groups have the ability to spend millions of dollars, which is what they did in the campaign and subsequent referendum effort around House Bill 6. 
Besides the massive effort on the part of First Energy to influence passage, there was also a concerted effort on the part of Ohioans for energy security to squash the signature collecting efforts of Ohioans against corporate bailout that aimed to put House Bill 6 on the ballot in November of 2020. Ohioans for energy security began to place ads designed to scare people from signing the petition by claiming the Chinese government would take over our energy grid. They even started a non-binding petition drive asking legislators to keep foreign interests out of Ohio's energy grid, the aim of which was to confuse voters and make them think they had already signed the referendum petition. Ohioans for Energy Security is one of those 501c4 organizations not required to disclose their contributors. Corruption thrives right in our own backyard. Back in 2018, a not-for-profit 501c4 was formed with the help of First Energy Corporation. The organization called Consumers Against Deceptive Fees began to work to educate Cleveland residents about the high fees charged by Cleveland Public Power. This is but a local example of how corporations use nonprofits to shield the movement of political money in Ohio used to influence outcomes favoring corporations. Let's face it folks, we're a cryptocracy largely ruled and influenced by their interest. We know according to state records, tax filing and campaign finance reports, Partners for Progress received 20 million from First Energy. We also know as a result of the FBI's investigation of the householder scandal that the funds Partners for Progress was holding eventually went to consumers against deceptive fees in the amount of $200,000. Additional money flowed into the not-for-profit totaling more than half a million dollars with many of the sources still unknown, but we can guess. Who would benefit selling electricity to the residents of Ohio? The contentious past relationship between Cleveland Public Power and First Energy is well known and appears to be ongoing. If the FBI had not launched an investigation into the householder situation, we would still likely be in the dark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Simone. I believe we are down to our last speaker, unless um, I'm, I've missed someone, but um, Gregory Coleridge was able to join us this evening from National Move to Amend. Uh, Mr. Coleridge, if you'd like to provide testimony, you're welcome. But we have you on mute still. <laughs> Here I am. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thanks to council members for being on the call and everyone who came and uh, has testified. Sorry, I was a little late. Uh, I'm uh, Greg Coleridge, National Outreach Director of Move to Amend. Uh, corporations are not people and money is not speech are the two constitutional doctrines at root of the Cleveland Initiative that was enacted in 2016. The same is true of the 704 other communities, seven states, and over 600 organizations that have taken formal positions supporting the Move to Amend Initiative. In addition to the 480,000 individuals who signed uh, a petition, the We the People Amendment, HGR 48, which would abolish both of these bizarre doctrines, is more than simply overturning Citizens United and more than simply ending money as free speech. It includes ending all forms of corporate constitutional rights. Without abolishing all corporate constitutional rights, not simply money, uh, political free speech rights. This is what could happen. For examples, one, efforts by Cleveland City Council or residents to say, require a lawn care company to require the disclosure of specific toxic chemicals used on city or private properties could be challenged in court as a violation of a corporation's first amendment right not to speak. Two, efforts by Cleveland City Council or residents to require city inspection of a corporation to protect, say, workers or the environment could be challenged in court as a violation of a corporation's Fourth Amendment privacy rights. Three, 
efforts by Cleveland City Council or residents to protect homeowners from a company digging or say drilling under private homeowners could be challenged in court as a violation of a corporation's Fifth Amendment takings rights to lost future profits. And four, efforts by Cleveland City Council or residents to provide preferential treatment to locally owned businesses over say a chain store that sends its profits outside the community could be challenged in court as a violation of a corporation's 14th Amendment equal protection rights. Just as a reminder, the 14th Amendment, my friends, was intended solely to protect freed slaves. These examples of corporate hijacking of constitutional amendments intended exclusively for human beings doesn't include the scores of ways corporate entities can and have abused the Constitution's Commerce Clause to support corporate interests over the police powers of communities. That's what you on city council have used in the past, police powers to protect the health, safety, and welfare of residents. My dad built an addition to our house pretty much all by himself. He said when doing so that it was essential when planning each task to make sure the tools, material, time, and energy were proportionate in scale to what was needed. Pouring three inches of a concrete base when six was required, using two inch by two inch lumber when two by eights were needed, or pounding one inch nails when two inch nails were called for might look like a job well done. But because the thickness, width, and length of materials didn't match the needed scale and proportion, the house would eventually crack and crumble. The same goes for democracy. Believing that we can create authentic democracy by simply or solely electing better representatives or passing the For the People Act, HR1, or simply having better regulations of political campaign spending or corporate harms is equivalent to not enough thickness, width, or length in building a house addition. They all may seem sufficient and to a certain extent they're all needed, but they aren't nearly enough in scale and proportion to address the fundamental, if not existential multiple crises, my friends, that we are facing, economic, political, and ecological. We can't afford anymore to be small when big massive change is needed to address massive systemic problems. Only the We the People Amendment, HGR 48, nails it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us this evening. I do, I do want to recognize uh, my council colleagues who have been part of, of this evening. Uh, I know that some of them could, couldn't stay until this point in the, in the testimony. Uh, we had Councilman Blaine Griffin with us earlier this evening. Uh, Councilman Mike Polensic, I believe, has been able to, to join and listen. Councilman Polensic, do you want to offer a comment? Uh, just can you hear me, Madam Chairperson? Sure can. Uh, just to commend all who took the time. Democracy in government is very important. Um, I, as a senior member, I appreciate everyone's comments and opinions, and everyone um, presented themselves in a very professional manner, very dignified way. And um, it's all about people's participation. Uh, people make the difference. People are our government. So uh, I again, I thank you all who took this time to uh, express your view points, your opinions. I share many of, 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 I share many opinions with you, I might add. So um, I'll leave it at that, Ms. Ma Madam Chairman, and I thank you for chairing the meeting in an orderly fashion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilman Polensic. Thank you for joining and for your comments. And I see that uh, Councilman Kevin Bishop was able to participate. I'm not sure if he um, is able to access his mic or if he'd like to say any, any words, but I also appreciate the uh, participation of Councilman Bishop. And with that, I'm going to offer some concluding comments. I too, uh, like Councilman Polenzik, would just like to thank all of you for really an outstanding leadership this evening. I wanted to invite Ms. Romanoff, if you wanna make a, a closing remark before, before I make my closing remarks. To unmute myself here. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you all very much. Um, the things that people have to say are very, very special. 
and um, I wish we could broadcast them in, in much wider than um, we have right here. But everybody really did a wonderful job in choosing very important topics, which, which can each be researched much more and we can learn a great deal from. So um, I really wanna thank you for participating because this is a lot of work actually. And um, yay for all of you for being here. So <laughs> I thank you very much. And I thank the city council, Cleveland city council and um, Spencer and Plansick, Mr. Plansick and all the, the people who come because um, we, we need all of you. <laughs> we count on you. So we need to work together. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure personally to meet you and to get to know the work of Move to Amend Better. And again, to, to uh, hear from each of you this evening to hear this testimony tonight. Thank you so much. I would also like to recognize our council staff who made this evening possible. Thank you for your hard work um, behind the scenes to just make sure this went smoothly and was well coordinated. So thank you so much to Cleveland City Council staff. And with that, I just wanted to remind everybody of what to expect after our virtual Democracy Day 2021. Um, within a week of tonight's hearing, the Clerk of Council must submit a letter to the entire state legislature and the to the Congress that includes the, the core of why Democracy Day exists, that only human beings, not corporations, are legal persons with constitutional rights. Uh, also, as a reminder, this is a biennial event through May of 2027 or until a constitutional amendment is passed by two thirds of the state's legislatures. Um, and again, just wanna thank you all for being here this evening and uh, I'll look forward to our next gathering into all the important work we have to do locally at the state level and nationally uh, to, to ensure a healthier democracy. Thank you so much, everybody.